number from 1010 with beat. Uh, here is the bullet explanation part two, where we're gonna cover the snail, uh, the expansion, as well as our standing techniques. So I'm gonna talk about the design process for the snail, uh, which I will start with the stage robot. Here's a final version of the snail over there, but we did not start with this. Um, the way we design the snail is, the snail is based around the set of intake rollers. Um, I see. So specifically just these angle changing pieces, I'm gonna show you with my hand and then you can unload it out of the way. Yeah, so those two rollers are critical for the snail because they involve, um, they're involved with the angle change of the discs. Um, yeah, so as we all know, the snail is pretty simple. It just gets the disc from intake to the stagger, um, but it needs to do so very quickly and efficiently um, without losses in friction and without overheating the motor. Um, so the way that we designed this snail, or the snail, the state snail, um, is we first took the piece, attached it at the bottom, like below the set of rollers. Um, we mounted the, all set of rollers that we need for the snail. And then I basically bent this snail like this, and then Alex would just feed discs like this, and they would just be going through the snail. I'd be moving it a little bit, just back and forth, up and down, just to see what the best position for the snail is. Um, and we determined that by just measuring like how fast it is, um, whether we saw any noticeable hitches. Um, hitches, I mean like you get caught here and then go. So it needs to be as smooth as possible, try to be as constant speed as possible, but as constant of a speed as possible. Yeah, so once we found that, um, we kind of formed the basis of the snail. And after that, it's just all about the improvements, which I'll just briefly go over. Um, so first things we noticed, uh, there was a black line in the middle of the snail um, once we, after we fed a couple of discs, which is why we introduced this cutout. Um, so the black line indicates that this edge of the disc, like this point of the disc was like significantly rubbing against the snail. Um, so we just made this cutout uh, just so that, let me see if you can see this. When the disc is traveling, uh, there's two points of contact on the disc and the, ed the basic the forces, yeah, the forces are just more spread out, I guess I would call it. Um, yeah, uh, what's important with that though is that we don't have two strips, we have one piece with the cutout and that preserves structural integrity. Um, so the pieces, of these strips themselves, they can move independently, but at the end of the day, they st snap back to like the same line, um, the same kind of yeah, plane uh, as the main piece, um, and they're the same things like with themselves. So you, it is really beneficial to have this. Um, yeah, so next I'm gonna talk about the snail on this robot specifically, um, which here I have the very first piece uh, for this robot before we switch to acetal. Um, we did the same process on our States robot by just attaching it, attaching it here and then we're curving it. Uh, yeah, so same basic process as a States robot. Only difference is that on our States robot, we had all of them as two inch flex wheels, but here at the top, we have 1.65 inch flex wheels or 1.5 inch, which we call them because I don't want to say 1.65 all the time. Um, and this made the snail just a bit different because these are farther back and uh, it just, it's a different geometry, right? Uh, so the critical thing with the snail is, as I said before, the disc needs to go smoothly. And the way we achieve that, um, you know, just push the disc through is, you know, the disc has a lot of room for air a lot of space to do whatever it wants. As you can see here, um, the disc is not contacting this set of flex wheels after it exits this. I, I, I'm pushing the disc up and it's going all the way back. Um, this is not a problem because when you're intaking the disc, you're running at full speed. So there's enough momentum to push it up to this stage. Um, but as you can see, the amount of friction the disc experiences, the amount of like resistance to changing angle is very, very minimal, especially at the bottom over there. Um, and there is more resistance to that angle change at the top, but again, we apply the same principle that uh, it can still fall back down onto the flex wheels. Um, it just, it will have enough speed to get to the top. Um, and here we start slowing down, be partly because of the smaller flex wheels, but also because of the geometry of the snail. 
Um, so when the disc goes to get to the top, it needs to change from vertical to parallel or parallel to the shooter. Um, and what helped with that is this massive gap in between the intake and the flex wheel. So, th so at, I'm gonna keep put the disc right here. And as you can see, you can probably fit another disc, uh, maybe even two if they're staggered um, through there. And that gap was very critical um, to maintain the smoothness of the disc. I'm still not very happy with the amount of resistance that we're facing over here, um, but we had to do it this way because of the height limit. Um, so maybe it's, there's probably a way to do it better, but that's just one thing I would note uh, for improvement. But still, yeah, this gap at the top um, helps a lot. So you need to get that resistance all the way down, um, which allowed us to get this really smooth or relatively smooth uh, snail. Uh, yeah, that's about it. helps us control the friction uh, for each element, uh, with the intake scoop, the snail, and the actual shooter. Um, it's most critical on the intake, um, which is yeah, decreasing the friction as much as possible, just gets you that faster disc intake. Okay, so we use this tool, uh, the circular sander, to sand all our elements, the robot, just you know, apply it on it, it sands, you move it around. Um, it gets a very nice and even uh, level of sanding so you don't have, have to worry about inconsistency. Um, so we tried 100 grit, 200, 320, 400, and 1000 grit um, on each element of the robot. Uh, we found that 200 is great for the intake scoop, the snail, as well as the blooper. Uh, and then 400 was working really well for the actual indexer. Uh, so it was all found just through experiments. We tried everything. Uh, trial and error on the robot. So next I want to talk about our expansion. Um, we've been rocking this design since NorCal Signature, so it's been a while. Um, it's just went through a couple modifications in terms of just sizing and spacing. Um, so here is one of the very first modules that we've made. Um, yeah, it's pretty simple, um, just connected like this. Very firm and sturdy. Uh, can, you know, is it firm and sturdy? All that. Um, we, we use one piston to release three strings uh, because we don't need to do more and why waste the cylinders? Um, so yeah, the design of the expansion gets 28 tiles um, when oriented properly, which yeah, we just have to make sure that they're on each robot, we just reorient them the same angle, same direction, all that. Um, all right, so onto this actual robot expansion. Um, the main goal is we're making it DQ proof, uh, maintaining the 28 tile expansion and uh, getting it within the footprint of the robot. Uh, so first I want to talk about the footprint. Uh, so we had to move this side expansion backwards um, from where it was on here, um, meaning we just re oriented the piston and all that. Um, I wonder if you get a top down view just to see. Yeah, so this is all with more or less within the wall of the robot. It's a couple millimeters outside and we found that when our driver was driving around, he sometimes clipped that pole right next to the goal. Um, and we fixed that by adding this zip tie um, because the, the, as a pole would come in, this would kind of just support it, bounce it out a little bit. Okay, so we maintained the 28 tiles just by having the same angles and all that. Um, and making a DQ proof was actually pretty interesting. Um, as you can see, the design is pretty different, sort of somewhat different from this. Uh, as you can see, we moved this spacer down below here um, meaning that this actual vector of the slingshot was pointed a bit more downwards, meaning that in extreme situations, we would not shoot outside. Um, meaning so yeah, our ramps weren't as much as ramps anymore as just plastic coverings, but they do have a slight bit of a bump. Um, yes, yeah, so we tested this expansion in a lot of, lot of positions. Um, so we tested it 
normally, got the 28 tiles. Uh, we tested it when the robot was slightly angled. Um, and the fact that, you know, the expansion was low helped a lot. Um, so we tested it when it was angled, just to make sure that it wouldn't shoot outside. And then we also tested it when it was oriented in this way, as well as angled. And of course, when you're facing completely up against the wall, like this, but because our expansion is low and also oriented slightly downwards, you're not gonna get expanded over there, pretty obvious, yeah. Okay, so uh, just to wrap up the expansion, uh, we're using only two pistons per side, and that's because um, this piece, which moves up and down to push the expansion up, uh, can cover three standoffs if they're all relatively close to each other. Um, since it's plastic, we can pretty much cut it and drill it however we want. And we drilled these um, using trial and error. As you can see, the holes aren't perfect. Um, they're pretty oval shaped because yeah, we had to adjust them based on how the expansion was launching. Um, so yeah, only two pistons per side. Uh, and this moves up using this piston to launch the expansion. Uh, maybe I can actually launch one. All right, that should wrap up our robot explanation. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the comments below. Um, yeah, don't forget, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, thanks for watching.